you are in the presence of God in that moment that he is there with you and these words come to mind. As a heart longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold his face? It was David who wrote the Psalms for us. And God gave it to us a gift as a way for us to form our prayers when he says, I will complain and I will lament in the morning. And I will give my praise. And the Psalms are a gift for us to help shape our prayers so that we can pray both praise and lament and complain to God through that. It's David's Psalms were written through the experiences he had in his life. Let me give you a couple experiences of mine. Forty years ago, Olympia Arena. My dad took me to see the Detroit Red Wings play. As we went in that stadium or that arena of close to 20,000 people, you actually could stop and listen to the puck hit the ice and the sticks and the skates and the anger and the energy put in by the players is somehow 20,000 people could be quiet enough to watch and observe the game and hear all the flow of it. And then a sudden roar of the crowd as we responded to the play that was there. And ironically, in that 20,000 seat arena, there was silence. And there was a chance for us to sit and listen and observe. Come back maybe six or seven or eight years ago at another arena, Air Canada Center. I was there to watch the Toronto Raptors play. The music is blaring. You can feel in that arena of 20,000 people the beat of the uh, speakers just flowing through your body. There are fireworks going off. There are dancers that are continually running across. There's a guy on a trampoline hopping and doing jumps and dunks with the ball. Any moment that you were there, you were bombarded with noise and visual sights and you were overwhelmed. It's like the marketers are scared of the pregnant pause. That any time during that game, there would be a moment of silence, would be a dangerous thing for us to be left with our own senses. And what was happening is that we were experiencing a tragedy, in my mind, of incessant noise and uh, impressive, oppressive, intrusive presence. You could never be left alone, and you could be never left alone with your thoughts. Now, what had changed in those 34 years? It's like this epidemic, a subtle dis-ease of our culture to drown out silence. And accompanying that invasive barrage of perpetual noise is this right for instant accessibility. The demand our culture has on us and our time at their preference to demand of us anything they want. In fact, you cannot escape from this. It has become a super saturation of the senses. We cannot be alone. And we fight the television, the radio, the iPod for this sudden tsunami of zeros and ones into our lives. And it affects our ability to hear the voice of God, let alone our own souls. So I want you to think about your story and talk to the person beside you again and ask this question. How does technology assault your senses and your time? Or is this just an old man's perspective of the disease? So ask that question. When are you confronted and when are you assaulted with sounds and technology that take over your voice, your silence, and your right to time? Go ahead, have a conversation. <laughs>
So is this, are you in your conversations, are you seeing it as a gift or a tragedy? Have you seen it, seen it as a gift? Less of a gift. Pardon? Less of a gift. Less of a gift? <coughs> tragedy? Or tragedy. Yeah, so what are the things? Like, who? Wake, what do you wake up to? Okay. Right? Music. Music. Okay, music goes on. How many put the TV on right away in the morning? Okay? Do we woke, wake up and we want to have the Today Show play this? Uh, the radio, we drive, everywhere we drive, play the radio. There's those things that happen. What are those things that take precedent and choose to interfere in our time and take, uh, take charge of us? Emails. Email, that's right, yeah. What is this addiction to? I have to answer my emails immediately. Other things. Texting. Yeah, texting. All right, yes, that's right. Telephone. And just, doesn't it just come at you? Like, am I, is there some resonance here? Let me tell you about a canoe trip. Uh, I took, me and my, I forget who took me, we took a bunch of juvenile delinquents from downtown Windsor. This was 35 years ago. And we went up to the Mississauga River in three or four canoes. And we got on that river, and after about seven or eight days out, uh, we got out so far from civilization that there was nothing around us. And one of the rules before we went was you could take no telephones, no, we didn't even have phones then. It would have been like Walkmans. We <laughs> allowed no technology. As we're out there canoeing and thinking, this is so beautiful. And saying to the guys, like, isn't this just amazing? And the response from those kids was uh, a fear and this uh, hatred of the silence. As we explored further, what they were encountering for the very first time was being stripped naked of all the defenses we put up for dealing with the subtleties and the, the violence in our souls. And it was ugly for them. And so what they were doing is they had surrounded themselves with noise and distraction that kept them from facing up to what was really inside their soul. And we use that, and I think our culture gives it to us, because if not, we will feel the pain Sometimes we'll hear ourselves think, and we don't like what we hear and what we sense. So we have this dis-ease with silence and being alone. And we are diseased, diseased with obsessive noise and that intrusive presence. And so there's two implications of being in this state. The first one is that we become a culture that's unable to easily escape without taking serious intentional efforts. And the second one is, in the process of our culture, we've also not only drowned out our own soul's voice, but we've also drowned out the voice of God. And so for him to get our attention, he needs some type of two-by-four to whack us on the side of our head because we cannot hear him, and we've lost the ability to really, truly hear the voice of God. Or hopefully, he's waiting patiently for us to come to our senses and ask the question, where is he? But the fear is that we become so unfamiliar with listening that we really don't hear him when he's speaking to us. And so we could miss out on hearing God speaking healing to our pain and be present in our loneliness. So we need to shut up and shut out and then listen carefully. Now as a contrast community, the kingdom of heaven called the church, we need solitude and we need prayer to counteract the side effects, to be the antidote to the disease of our culture. And as a kingdom culture, every once in a while we need to step into the kingdom of heaven and shut down and simplify and waste our time just sitting and listening to the still small voice and being waiting for God. And so in the six traditions of the church's 2,000 years, 
There is the contemplative or the contemplative tradition that provides that antidote to this dis-ease. And those from this tradition practice two opposites. And the one was a yearning for the presence of God to be experienced every moment of my day and my life. And the other one was this stealing away for a romantic rendezvous with God to practice at times through the day praying and listening and practicing prayer. So 500 years ago, there was a fellow named Brother Lawrence, who was a monk, who did the dishes all day long, and he was a simple kitchen helper. He blended those work with prayer. And as he peeled potatoes and he washed pots and pans, he anticipated that Jesus was just beside him, present in everything he did. And so he purposed regularly, all day long, to enter into a thoughtful and expected conversation and to sense the love and presence of Jesus beside him. Now his was an attitude of partnership, okay? pleading for grace and mercy on those he served, he would be praying for them. He'd be attentive to the creation and the beauty around him. And he would always be sensing the way God would be prompting him to respond to people and to everyday contact and experiences. And so his life became 24-hour ongoing prayer. He took the saying of Jesus seriously. When Jesus said, Lo, behold, I am with you always, he took that seriously and attempted to work that into his whole life. That whatever my role is, Jesus is present. Whether you're driving a cab, or doing the dishes, or you're working on the line, or you're hanging out with friends, or you're walking the dog, Jesus is there with you, beside you. That you are not alone. I am not alone in my activities. Jesus is there, and God is inviting me to actually be present with him. And in his small book called Practicing the Presence of God, he mentions that over time it became second nature to him, that the discipline profoundly and delightfully changed the way he saw his world. It was a world that Jesus was always present in. The second aspect, or opposite, the one was uh, Jesus always present, praying continually, is this idea of stealing away from a romantic rendezvous with God. And on Renewin, who just died maybe 15, less than 20 years ago, was a Harvard scholar who had seen success in all that he did, and he had put that aside and pushed it away to accept residence at L'Arche in Montreal, which is a community for the mentally handicapped. And his job was to serve, to live with someone who was incapable of caring for themselves, what we would call the least of these. And he did their laundry, their dishes, and cared for them day in, day out. He humbled himself, and in that place, he found Jesus. And he talks about how our culture's life is absurd. And he says the Latin for absurd is death. That we are in a world that's made us absurd, has made us death. And he says we need to choose the word obedient, which actually comes from the Latin, which means to listen. And he says in our obedience, we confront the absurdity or the deafness of this world and we can listen to God. And it's in silence and solitude in those disciplines that we're able to pray and have a conversation, a two-way conversation with God. So we need to fast from super saturation of our senses. So we turn off our technology, we shut down the visual stimulation, and we stop our movement, and we come to the uncomfortable nature of silence for us. It is hard to be silent. As we sit in silence, though we anticipate with expectancy the presence of God to join us. So first we make a space of solitude and anti-distraction. The mind is the chair in the living room by the window. And my back is in a sense away from it. And it's early in the morning, and no one is up yet. The dog barely has risen. And I wake up before anyone else is up, and the noise of the day has begun. Or at night, if it's time for you, when all is gone quiet in your house. And you quiet your heart and your body, and you do that by slowly breathing. So you breathe in slowly, and you breathe out slowly. Breathe in slowly, 
deep. We'll read that one. And God, as we learned last week, is not spirit and soul or body. He does not separate them. He's melded us together. And the way we control our bodies affects our spirit and our soul. And in quiet in ourselves, it's like what the psalmist says. He says, I do not worry about the big things. I calm myself like a baby after it's weaned. It's been fed. It's calm. And the next thing we do is we use our imagination as we did with our hands as we did by going and joining David by the side of that river. And we go to a place that becomes a safe place for you to visit with God. Imagination, if you think of Psalm 23, how does David say, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. David's using his, our imaginations to meet in a special safe place with God. There's a, an icon that's going to come on the screen by a rublev. And this icon was painted 700 years ago in 1410. And it's from the Russian Orthodox Church. And you can imagine in Russia at this time, the literacy rate of the Russian people was probably 1 to 2%. So over 90% of the people could not read. And so communication and discipleship of the Bible was done through imagery and through pictures. And what we have here is the story of the three men, the three angels who came to visit Abraham and sat down to, for hospitality with Abraham. But there's a deeper level of meaning to this picture, and it's actually a picture of the Trinity. And the Trinity sitting down at its table to feast. But what's missing in the sense of the table? You know, meat. There's the fourth side. And what the picture is, is it actually invites us to the presence of the Trinity, to the table of the Trinity. And it's what prayer is all about. That we sit with the Father, Son, and the Spirit, and he invites us to sit and feast with him. To share not only communion, but communion which is with union, with oneness, we come to the table. And in a literate community, this would have been a wonderful picture to tell them, to take them with them through the week of what God invites us to do. So picture your prayer as the conversation that you have at the table. Now, if you're a guest there that's been prepared for you, as it has, what verses come to mind? Are there other verses in Scripture that this picture speaks of? That's an open question. Any stories or scripture passages that come to mind about feasting in the present? Yeah. Uh, I was just thinking of uh, when Jesus was eating with uh, uh, two of the disciples after his death. Yeah, it's very good. Uh, right. John 21. Jesus makes breakfast and goes and finds his disciples and reconciles with them. And Invites them to come and eat with them. Oh, that's what that's a different one. You're thinking of the road to Emmaus. The road to Emmaus, Jesus goes and sits at the table. And it's in the presence and eating a meal that uh, he's revealed to them. It's, there's, two, there's two good ones, yeah. I, it said in this icon that um, like there's God the Father sitting on one side and, and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They're, they have this direction. They're looking at the one person. Like there, there's three persons in the Trinity. Yeah. And there, there's two with their, their view toward the one, uh, mm-hmm. giving them one honor. Uh, and as well, in the middle, there's a cup, which kind of represents the, uh, the Eucharist. Yes. Good. That's, that's excellent. Uh, what does Jesus say to one of the churches? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if you'd open the door, I'll come in and, and, and have supper with you. I thought it up. Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the... You know, how does that verse go? Prepare a table before... In the presence of my enemies, Jesus will prepare a table for us in the midst. There's a lot of imagery that is in the scripture, the metaphors, that speak about eating together with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And so when you pray, you can use your imagination of being at the table of the Trinity who invites us into uh, communion with him. So as you pray, how, if you thought yourself, not praying alone to some God up there, but actually praying to the members around the table, 
How would it change your conversation? What would you say differently, knowing that you're sitting with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit? I'll tell you an experience I had of how imagination had a profound effect on me. We were reading Psalm 23 uh, with the spiritual director, and we were working through the picture of the 23rd Psalm, and uh, this image came to me of a backpack I was carrying while in the 23rd Psalm. And with my spiritual director, we sat down and said, well, what's in the backpack? Why is it so heavy? And as I opened it and looked into it, and this is in a sense praying or conversation with God, realizing there's a lot of packages, but there's one significant, profound package in it that I cannot take out. And we realized that there were smaller packages around it that I had to take out first before I could get my hands on the big one. And what it was was a two-year process for us eventually moving down to Windsor to imagine the big thing it was for us to move from uh, Mississauga back home to Windsor. But there were a lot of things I had to deal with properly and effectively in the experience and my job up in Mississauga. But it was through that prayer and that conversation and that imagination the Lord spoke through uh, the imagination uh, to give me insight back from what he wanted us to do. Prayer is a conversation with God. I can give you another imagery of the Garden of Eden. And at the end of the day, Adam and Eve would be met by God, would meet him at the coolness of the day when the sun was just setting, and they would walk through the garden, and I'm sure Adam and God would talk about all the things he had uh, created, maybe some of the plants that he had uh, cross-pollinated, and some of the animals that he had named, and they would have a conversation together. And God, through prayers, asking us, coming into our lives, to walk with us and talk about our days. And so in that quiet place that you choose, and that you make for yourself, where you physically can be contemplative, ask them, or talk with them, what are you grateful for in this day? Where has the order been in the chaos? What are you worried about tomorrow? What are the emotions you've experienced? And listen to God. Sense his love and the good gifts he wants to give you and the direction and the insight he wants to provide for you. And encourage us all to persevere in the discipline, knowing that the habits of today's duty become tomorrow's life raft. And the patterns that we put in and the perseverance we do in the disciplines of prayer when the crisis, the complaints, and the laments, and the dangers come, we have this life raft that we've committed to, or that we've experienced or patterned our lives for, that provides the safety and the security for going through those storms. The daily practice of prayer establishes a pattern that we can fall back on and into, and will support us in future adversities. But don't forget, the purpose of prayer is to enjoy the presence of God and to sense that he dearly, deeply loves you. And so David said that, as the deer pants for living waters, so our heart pants for you, O Lord. So may your contemplative heart be a good counterculture to the disease that's in our world.
some ways having a service with so much silence can be so awkward. <laughs> but allowing the silence to penetrate our hearts, I feel like it's God fighting for us. He's saying, I'm here, I'm here. I've always been here. quiet yourself. It's scary, as Bob said, to allow the voice of God in the midst of that silence because it means confronting things that we're not too pleased about in ourselves, things that we're afraid of in ourselves. It says in the scriptures that the Lord has given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. Let's sing that chorus one more time. Lead me to the cross where we first met. Draw me to my so we can talk. Let me feel your breath. Let me know you're here with me. Now, in ending off all of our ancient future services, we would like to sing the doxology. So I invite you to stand, and uh, we will close with seeing the doxology that I'd like to invite Bob forward for our benediction. tempted with suicide, those who are sick in soul, and those who are in despair. Remember those who are in prison, all those who are under sentence of death. Remember the widows and widowers, the orphans, and those who travel in a foreign land. Remember all who this day will work under oppressive conditions. Remember the lonely. O oh Lord, you have called us to overcome evil with good and to pray for our enemies. We ask, Lord, that you have pity on our enemies, just as you have pity on us. Lead them, together with us, into your heavenly kingdom. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you for coming in. Just a few words of announcements. Uh, we're so, like we said before, we're really glad that you're here. Let me encourage you to invite your friends. 
If you feel like some people that you know can really benefit from experiencing the different streams of Christian faith throughout the centuries, invite them out. It would be great to have some more people here too. And um, if uh, you have any needs, if you have anything that uh, you need prayer about, or just any kind of support, or someone to talk to, uh, Bob, myself, we are all here to help you. So feel free to come up and chat if you need to. Have a great night. And there's a copy of the back if you want some. Thanks.